Yeah, well, like sort of one of the yeah the use cases. So it turns out 70% of all of our use cases, just for uh, interest sake, something in the cloud to something on premise. Yeah. So only 30% right now is just cloud to cloud. The number one use case, no doubt, a little bit because of the, the giant footprint that Salesforce has, is CRM to financial. So people want to do something, for example, like I've closed one an opportunity in Salesforce. I wanted to create a customer record in my financial system. That's the type of use case we see. Marketing automation, probably right on the heels of that. So I get a lead, I score it to a certain point, I want it to now create an opportunity in Salesforce. And from there it breaks up a little bit, but uh, HR talent management, recruiting type stuff tends to be the next uh, set of use cases. In the back. Do you have any <clears throat> intercompany use cases? So integration between different companies or supply chain? So inter and intra. Uh, so inter, we support EDI um, in the cloud, which I didn't really talk about. It's not the sexiest topic on the planet, but certainly is very pragmatic. Uh, so we do support EDI, intercompany, and intra companies. So if you have multiple geographies that you want to run on the same instance, one of the very cool things, again, I didn't talk too much about it, you can build an integration process once in a master account, inherit it into the sub accounts, so the geographies, and when you want to maintain that integration process, you change it one time, and it gets inherited into all the geographies. Very, very cool, very efficient use of the of the technology. Here. Uh, I'm afraid I have a six-part question. <laughs> <laughs> six You're not with cast iron, are you? Just, I just want to check. <laughs> okay. Six issues or hurdles. That, that was an inside baseball joke. Cast iron just got bought by IBM. So. Oh. Okay. Um, the first question I have is: uh, traditional server-based enterprise apps are heavily customized. How do you? deliver customized applications, enterprise applications to enterprises via the cloud. Then the next five are from Channel Web, which just had an article. And you mentioned integration as one issue. And it, in this article, it said that there's an extra level of integration required when you use the cloud. The next one is uh, big data headaches, that getting large amounts of data in and out of the cloud is almost impossible. And the article said the fastest way to transfer three or five terabytes is FedEx. Uh, <laughs> Three to five terabytes, I, I probably would agree with them. Um, yeah. Customers still want control and some don't want data to leave their premises. It's then it creates new silos that you end up with pockets of data that then need to be aggregated and integrated. And last but not least is regulation and legislation. There are data privacy laws, uh, there exist and laws and regulations vary by geography. So, <laughs> so much you can't. I, I will uh, I'll try to take them in the order that are. I'll be happy to take the last one. Okay. Good. Uh, so enterprise integration. You're absolutely right. In the old uh, paradigm, very hard to uh, sort of expose customizations that were done to the application. I think Boomi does about as good a job as we can do. We, we sort of layer on uh, that, that visual designer that you saw earlier. It works the same way whether you're reaching out to an on-premise app or whether you're reaching out to a SaaS application. So we've sort of simplified you know, how you interact with it. But a huge step forward with SaaS now because these guys can expose to us at design time uh, <coughs> custom fields, custom objects, we can bring that into the, des the integration design process. It's really new architecture. It, it, it really is, yeah, and it's, it's really If safe. apps are designed to be integrated, you will have much less um, pain and suffering later on. And you probably have similar stories, but we have customers who use two different products from the same vendor, mm -hmm. but integrate through us, oh. because that works better than using the very brittle binary level coupling tool that the vendor provided. It, it, absolutely. I mean, the one thing that we, we certainly give is sort of living, breathable, you know, breathing mm -hmm. integrations. Mm -hmm. In the old days, as soon as one app was customized, the hard-coded integration mm -hmm. broke. Yeah. And we have the ability to, to make that more dynamic. It was a glass slip rift. If it fits perfectly, but the minute you know the minute the foot grows, it doesn't fit at all. And and these are much more loosely coupled. Absolutely. Designed Absolutely. for a loosely coupled model. Why don't you take the last question, and then maybe I can get the other ones outside. Yeah, the residency thing is incredibly important because um, we have three data centers, but that's all, that's still only three: two in the U.S. and one in Singapore. And if you're in the EU, um, you can get very nervous about this. Uh, the, in Canada, they have a charming office called the Privacy Commissioner who regularly sends stinging memoranda to Parliament saying, um, guys, this treaty that you've signed us up for, uh, it only violates the Canadian Constitution in three places, um, so you're improving, but um, they're, and they're working on that problem. 
the critical epiphany that I think we would both say here is that you need to understand you don't make all or nothing choices. If you have data that's not allowed to leave the country, don't ship it out of the country. Keep that data local. Use a customer token, you know, customer ID number or something that has no sensitivity about it. Do all the cloud logic up here and then say, and now these are the 100 customers we most need to talk to. Who? These 100 customer ID numbers. And then you only look up the sensitive stuff like credit card numbers and other things in your local database because that's the only place you ever kept it. And this is how you can get cloud application efficiency without running afoul of this incredibly complex and volatile stew of regulation where the ink is not even dry on the pages. And anyone who claims to have a complete grip on this is either lying or delusional. Or both. Because the, there's no case law. And when you look at SB 1386 in California, there's even a suspected breach of a database you're required to disclose it. You've seen the big public notifications. We may or may not have had a database exposure. Unless the database is encrypted, then you don't have to do that. No one else in this room has read every word of SB 1386 looking for a definition of the word encrypted. But I can tell you, it's not there. There's no federal information processing standard, no algorithm specification, no key strength specification. It's not there. So a Captain Midnight secret decoder ring would technically qualify, but case law will inevitably say, well, come on, we all know that's right. not what a prudent right. person would call encryption. Right. And eventually we'll find out what the law means. But right now? In the courts, of course. Yeah, the courts will decide what the law means. And, and, and then multiply that by 80 or 90 for all the different jurisdictions that are industry specific, geography specific, you know, any number of different overlapping boundaries of, 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 of trust. So work with cloud providers who can afford and must, as a matter of staying in business, to have people on their staff who do nothing but try to track this. And then, by the way, you also get the other gravy that you clearly exercise due diligence. Mm -hmm. You clearly made a good faith effort of compliance because you were working with third parties instead of having your um, the guy who runs your um, your email system right. now become your chief compliance officer, so which is what a lot of people de facto have. Right. They have a chief compliance officer. It's the guy who runs the IT. So, anyway, so, yeah. so, so one so, more. The guy in the red sweater had his hand up long, no, long sure. session. Yeah, last question. Yeah. This seems to be the uh, technology or the distributed network computing. One speaker's uh, exclusive or focus is on enterprise, standing with enterprise. What is the impact of the, all this kind of technology to the smaller uh, startup entrepreneur company uh, uh, benefits? Could you two, th two thirds of our customers roughly are not enterprise scale. We're roughly one third, one third, Why? one third. Our, we have customers with five users. You, I don't know what okay. your smallest is, yeah. Whatever, but yeah, the, the small company. Choose benefits absolutely can benefit from this because the small company now can use the kind of tools that previously were only offered at an enterprise scale and where and if you and you didn't want to install an enterprise grade infrastructure to run your five person company so when i'm in places like india and hong kong the entrepreneurs are over this you know, like crazy the up the uptake rate for these technologies in asia pacific is four to five times the global average uptake rate because their their growth in their small and medium business sector is just fast. Uh, yeah. you, do you do a lot of business in Asia Pacific? We actually right do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, sure. he can share you your business steps. Uh, the most uh, important thing is you said is you direct see. interface to the, the web yeah. browser, and uh, you can really do not depending on a computer problem. That's right. Uh, we have had over seventy-five countries around the world use our software, try out the trial, and do integrations. Seventy-five countries. Now, I don't know how many countries we have. I know we support fourteen languages and you know, multiple currencies and time zones and things. We're on every continent but Antarctica. Yeah, what is the uh, most popular product for the very smaller uh, uh, users uh, for cloud? Uh, well, <laughs> most of our customers are still customer relationship management and Salesforce automation customers. The single most popular cloud application is probably email. Fair enough. You know? They're just, you know, and they just ripped out 1.3 million users in New South Wales and Australia where the educational system was exchange-based moved them all over to Google, to Gmail in two months without a hiccup. Thank you. Very That's the single largest adoption I know that went in one big bag. Awesome. The other um, current paradigm, uh, uh, paradigmatic example in the US is the city of Los Angeles where Novell lost to Google. And the CIO of Los Angeles says that 27 other major metropolitan CIOs have been on the phone with her since then saying, how did you sell this? Because I want to do this too. 
So, so we make a quick one last question, and then we can have drinks and follow up. Yeah. Keith, I guess. I don't mean to be the last question. Oh. Uh, um, it, it seems like a lot of the topics covered here could have gone back to 2004 in an SIA software industry event and heard a lot of the same conversation. It seems like some of the new stuff is that, I mean, I know we developed SaaS applications back in 2002 to 2004. A lot of the infrastructure pain points, there are companies emerging to help companies who want to build on top of the SaaS stack to emerge and, and make it really easy. Um, I guess my question is, I, and I'm specifically thinking of TIBCO and kind of their vision of the world. And I guess my question is, where is the SaaS infrastructure uh, in relation to very large companies that do it like tens to hundreds of millions of transactions, maybe even a second, who are trying to uh, find little bits of data from all these disparate silos of information to make sense of it. So real-time, huge amounts of data. I mean, this touches on your question about, you know, 40 terabytes of information needed to move around. So it's similar in the sense of tons of transactions, instantaneous access to that. Can kind of the current SaaS ecosystem handle those types of scenarios, which may not be applicable to, like, Meetup, you know, launching their yeah. Yeah. little company on top of the SaaS stack, but it has huge implications for like an Amex. In Why the same I... way that hardware companies like Intel looked to applications like home video editing to sell their expensive hardware, companies like Oracle and SAP are looking to massive in-memory database mining to sell their old software, which I think of as immensely powerful telescopes looking straight at your rear view mirror. <laughs> and what is the dawning realization in the marketplace is that almost all the really interesting data is not in your database. It's happening out there in your customer and partner ecosystems. And that incredible effort to mine everything that happened last month a little bit faster is now not as strategically interesting as mining what your customers are saying about you this morning. Yeah. And so I think that's really shifting the emphasis toward connectivity and real-time systems instead of massive data mining systems. Will there always be on-premise data centers? Yes, because there are some things companies do where small performance advantages are major competitive benefits. If you are running a stock exchange, a 3% edge in trade execution time is meaningful and you will build expensive proprietary systems to achieve that small edge. It's not a meaningful edge in opening an email. Yeah. And so you will not find, and so you will, you will, you will cloud that. Uh, and that's where I feel the, the decisions are gonna be made. They're gonna be made on economics. I think I'd add something critical to this. You know, the one thing I hear a lot is cloud and it's always referred to uh, just the general kind of cloud concept of cloud. If you separate cloud technology from cloud itself, the applicability of cloud technologies that were developed in support of huge massive networks like what Salesforce has or Microsoft has, applies within the data center that the enterprise has. So if you think about our technology, for example, the reason we have a grid in our name is we focus quite a bit on how do we stitch together tons and tons of servers into these really big scalable networks that have one goal in life, supporting applications that are living on top of it. So I think when you look at the scale properties that cloud introduced when it came to the R&D side of things and what people had to solve from a challenge point of view, this whole new kind of breed of uh, approaches to architecture has cropped up. Then middleware crops up to solve that abstractly, and then the enterprise can benefit from it. So uh, I think it was the COO of Morgan Stanley at the time, this was maybe a few months back, and mentioned something to the effect of, well, we're not interested in the cloud as the cloud itself, but we like the technologies that are coming out of it. You know, internal applicability of those really robust architectures. So I think at a bare minimum, the fact that the cloud has created these mass scale scenarios for web scale purposes has created middleware and technologies that are applicable to solve a lot of those challenges that you just talked about earlier. Um, and then the second piece is the fact that you know there are, as Peter pointed out, many scenarios where it just won't happen. You know, they're not going to move it to the cloud for a variety of reasons. Right now, they might be trivial and psychological. Later, they'll probably be more practical because the psychological ones will go away. So I think those two things will drive those, those types of complex problems, cloud applicability within the enterprise as a technology as opposed to outsourced or outside. I, I did demographic analysis and figured out that all material objection to the cloud would be gone by around Christmas Day of 2020, just based on the age of the people. <laughs> <laughs> but to, to adopt Sinclair's color coding convention, the words that should be read whenever they appear on your charts are can't 
and or. <laughs> if someone says, well, the cloud can't be secure, I'm sorry, that's intellectual laziness. It can be secure. The question is, is it cost effective to make it as secure as you need it to be for what you want to do? Well, that's a much more difficult question to answer than, is it secure? You can say, well, not, not enough. I'm sorry. You know, go, go do your homework. Yeah, Find out how secure problem. it has to be. Yeah. And the other word that doesn't belong is or. Because you don't have to make mutually exclusive choices. Yeah. I can use my .NET skills, and I can use my Force.com skills, and I can use third-party services. And if I'm smart, I am finding optimal combinations of those things instead of being lazy and picking the one least unsatisfactory one and now saying I have a class. Great. Well, I want to thank, I don't want to cut you guys off, but we can continue the discussion outside. Thank you so much. Peter, pleasure. Glad to meet you.